starting with the fact that EW, EWRM has really existed from the time great Mr. D. Loach wrote the EWRM book right before Anderson folded up. Uh, it's about 20 years. What's preventing companies from really appreciating the value of risk management? Uh, uh, Subhashish, uh, while a lot of people have spoken here about um, enterprise risk management, people not doing it, I have a slightly different view to it. Uh, I think when corporate governance or Clause 49 came into India, it was rock bottom. I mean, there was nothing. And we just thought at that point of time, can, can these Indian companies ever come up to that level of corporate governance? Okay, there are still issues, but I think we've done, we've come a long way. And in that, I think a lot of companies did ad adopt good risk management processes, my view. Uh, they adopted good uh, risk management processes at that time. But what happened is the companies which did it to tick the box and the companies who did it in spirit were the differentiators. So the ones who actually took it to in spirit are the ones who actually went and developed it well. And I think that's where, um, and you know the, the point we have been discussing along most when we, at least when I started my career in risk, I thought of business risk. And it was simple because we identified from the books, you could financial risk, you understood. But at that point of time, we really didn't understand what is the big elephant in the room. The big elephant in the room is all the risks which are outside your environment, outside your company. It was a socio-political socio risk, the, uh, uh, the risk from environment, the risk from the stakeholders, the other kind of risks which were actually impacting. And uh, uh, companies were getting technology in fact, today, if you look at it, today I could have a very successful company with a good business model doing very well. And then a new company comes in and completely disrupts that model. It's gone. It's over. And one can see that happen in so many cases. So I think the, the question of risk management has completely changed. It is about business. And the front line has to be led by business. It has to be led by the CEO. Any initiative of this kind, if it has not got the stamp of the CEO, and if he's not going to drive it, I, th I don't think it's going to go anywhere. It cannot be delegated down to the lowest bottom. So I would say, <clears throat> um, so CEOs face many challenges. And I think risk is one of them, is their biggest challenge. And if they understand it, I think you'll be successful. And I can tell you in this post-COVID and Nikola Modern, you have sat on so many boards. In post-COVID, the companies that actually bounce back faster are the ones which had better risk management. And the people who knew how to conserve cash, the people who had cash on their balance sheet, who used it, uh, because opportunities were also there. COVID was not a dead uh, thing. It was an opportunity. And I've seen so many companies actually take advantage of it and have done very well. So, so which is, I think uh, we, when we talk of risk, we look at it, the negative aspect. On the other side of risk is reward. And I think that's what we need to see. How do we actually capture that value out there and take it forward? Thank you, Richard. So, Richard, if you go back again to our Anderson days, uh, we were CAs. We, I, I personally was in the external audit practice, and then someday Sanjay Mehta said, I am going to start BPRC, Business Process Risk Consulting. We became BPRC. Thirma Ram was then there. He now is a big EY leader globally. Uh, we then renamed it to Contract Audit Services. Uh, we, did, we, we found ways to make it sound different. Uh, then we said BPRC plus TRC, which is Technology Risk Consulting, became risk advisory. Uh, but fundamentally, we're the same sort of people. And which is why I say the biggest risk in the world possibly is the fact that risk professionals are the most untrained risk professionals themselves. How do you see this changing, uh, both in the corporate world, who don't even have the luxury of what the big fours have, and in the advisory world? So uh, I think everybody's un misunderstood enterprise risk management. And I think you hit the nail on the head, and it's a very good question. Because uh, I'm also guilty. When we put up risk management, what we did, we took these resprayed auditors and made them into risk consultants. And if you really want good risk consultants, they have a very different mindset. They've got to be engineers. They've got to be MBAs. They've got to be economists. You need those kind of people who have a deep understanding of business because only they can make those. All the risks happen in the business. They don't happen at the back end. And I don't think chartered accountants per se are qualified <clears throat> to be risk managers. This is my view, and I'm just putting it down there. 
And I remember this one thing came to light when we got a very big risk enterprise risk management ex uh, exam. And we put our normal team out there, and the guy said, no, this team can't work. We need your consultants, the real consultants, not the these trade auditors. So I think the what happened in the big four was post Anderson, when they were building out their consulting practices, most people who were auditors became consultants. And over a period of time, they became experts. You do two engagements and you're an expert. You do three engagements and you are a, you are the this thing of it. But uh, I think those are some misnomers that have happened. And I think we have to go back to the basics. And we need to understand that the internal auditor will be the person who will be a chartered accountant, cost accountant, or whatever. But the risk management professional has to be somebody from the business who understands business and who can go deep into it. And that kind of person can truly bring value to it. Because just imagine talking to a business leader and telling him, uh, you know, this is wrong. What will you be able to tell him as a chartered accountant? But if you are somebody who's been there, will be able to have a very useful discussion and be able to add value. Because ultimately, in my view, it's about adding value to the process. And if you're able to add value to the process, I think that's when we will, uh, we will see the difference coming in risk management. So I think you also need some different kind of skills, complex problem solving skills. Uh, you need to be innovative in your thinking. You need to have creative thinking. So it's not about qualification today. I think we have to move away from these qualifications. It's about how students are being brought up. And I think uh, uh, Professor Rajan, while you did not speak about it, but I think even universities and colleges and all need to change the thinking of students of how they solve problems. Because that is what is going to differentiate. Because nobody's asking, are you a chartered accountant? Are you a finance uh, HR professional? They are asking, do you have these skills today? So it's just building on what you have said in terms of uh, student uh, sort of universities, do you think students today have, like, so you started this whole campus stuff at KPMG as well with the risk practice. Do you think there's enough appreciation in the student community, awareness, I wouldn't say appreciation, awareness in the student community of what a career in risk management can actually evolve to be for it to attract talent at that grassroots level of the quality that you need to have all those skills that you're talking about, problem solving, analytical thinking. Do you think there is enough awareness around that for it to be to be happening well? So much amongst the students, I think it has to be amongst the corporates who are going to do the hiring. I think the corporates need to understand, do they want risk professionals? True risk professionals to sit there and look at it. And once they understand they require it, I think uh, we, would, uh, uh, we, we would see the change. Students, uh, why will student do a course? He does a course because he or she can get a job after that. And if he does, uh, suppose he does a course with your institute, and after one year there is no job, people will stop coming because they pay so much fees for a course. And then it doesn't actually uh, uh, convert into anything. So my suggestion, uh, Sovashish, is I think there needs to be much more awareness among the corporates. And like in the, you know, like I remember when IFRS first came, everybody didn't understand the enormity of IFRS. So what they did was they did board trainings, they did senior management trainings, awareness sessions. Who trained the army of accountants who had to now look at accounting very differently? And that's where all the issues all started. So there'll have to be army of people who also will need to be trained. So these students which you are doing is fantastic because you are training them at ground level. But I think we need to take this to different levels. We need to take it to mid-level, mid senior management level, board level. Because this, uh, according to me, Today, uh, lifelong learning it is. So once you get out of college at 24 or MBA or whatever, you have to keep coming back at different parts of your career. So even if you are 60 years old, you will still come back to do a course and do something different. So I think it is time that uh, uh, we bring uh, this uh, enterprise risk management. We make it attractive. See, because is it attractive enough for students to do it? Will they get a job which will pay for the, you know, will make it there? Some people understand it. The fact that you have taken out 200 professionals, Mr. Bhargav, you said 200 professionals have come out. So obviously they're working somewhere and obviously they're doing well. And, um, uh, but we need to spread it much more. 200 is not good enough for a country of India's size. Maybe in Delhi also it's not enough. So, uh, so I, I'm not blaming you, but I think it needs to get into the university. And uh, uh, Professor Saxena has already said there is no appreciation of it. Because education is making its good money. It doesn't need uh, to be shaken up too much. 
uh, and uh, I think, uh, but I think these new courses have to come in. Risk management can be one course that actually universities can take up for that, from that purpose. But I think you need to make it, so I mean, why don't you and Fiki and others actually make it an attractive proposition when we go to corporates and tell them, boss, you need these kind of uh, risk professions in your team. And they will start hiring people at good salaries. Because you can't pay a risk professional the salary of, uh, sorry if I'm going to say something now, of an internal auditor. Because uh, uh, th they are a differentiated lot. And I think we need to pay it. Because I'll tell you, in our business, when I was running in the big four, I realized that if you wanted to track good talent in some places, you didn't have to bother about your salary banks. You never get them. And you cannot democratize everything else because then you are in loss making company. So I think we must make risk professionals so attractive that people get well compensated, they study hard, they, uh, they are well qualified to actually do it. I think we should start attracting engineering students into this because their mindset thinking is very different. I think they can make very good risk professionals. This is my view. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I can't sort of not respond to some of it before going back to a question to you. Uh, one, uh, we do have lots of engineers come to the institute. Uh, two, uh, the big fours are the primary employers today. Uh, we are giving the business schools a run for their money in terms of what the initial compensation is, but it's still not, it's still the internal order salary. So, so that was just my response to your comment. Uh, I was feeling very good because these guys came and gave this to me. I thought I've done consulting, now gone into academia. I thought I was a chance to move to the media world now. This says business world, but unfortunately, this is not working. So I'm going to come back to this. Uh, you heard me talk about one of the myths, Richard, which is uh, the CEO still forwards risk management stuff to the head of audit. How do you change that? How do you drive home the fact that this is a first and second line of defense? This is at the heart of business, as you yourself called out. How do you drive that change? Okay, I'll just tell you, <clears throat> I'll just give in a different context, I'm sorry, um, uh, nothing to do with risk here. Uh, when I left KPMG, uh, while I was at KPMG, I was proud of one thing which I did was, I launched the higher purpose in KPMG. And it was one of the most successful launches within the KPMG world in India. It got reported by Harvard, uh, they did a case study on it. And uh, it was a very successful launch. Uh, why? Because the CEO personally took it as his agenda. First, I gave it to HR, honestly. Nothing happened. So uh, I'm not saying HR is bad, but I gave it to them. Nothing happened. So I said, no, this is my cup of tea. I've got to run it myself. And I did it. And um, so when I left KPMG, about a little after a year, KPMG India, a uh, little after a year, very big technology co IT company, you know, maybe one of the biggest in the country, called me and asked me, that would you do this higher purpose for us? Would you come and put it for us the way you did it at KPMG? I said, uh, who's driving this initiative? Does the CEO drive this initiative? They said, no. I said, then I'm the wrong person. Because if this is not driven from the CEO, this will be a flop. This will be one more tick in the box, and nothing is going to happen. And with all honesty, uh, Subhashish, whenever I meet people from KPMG, the one thing, ex-KPMG now, when uh, I meet some of them are also ex, they say we can never forget that higher purpose. So I think uh, it is something which sticks with people the way you put it across, that it never leaves you. But I think the CEOs which actually give it away to internal audit or give it away to somebody else are abdicating their responsibilities. Because nobody has thought of risk management being serious. But if you have not thought of risk management being serious, then there's a wake up call already there for many of the companies. And I think those cases need to be put out because you will put all the good cases, you never put the failures. Once we put the failures out there and tell them, if you have a good risk management process, yeah, it's expensive, it's not cheap. But just imagine not having it and what is the expense you incur in terms of penalties and liabilities and losses and everything else that you face. And I think that is something that needs to be put to them CEO has to drive a robust risk management process themselves. It has to be driven at the XCOM. Secondly, I think one thing that is missing in this entire, I don't know whether you will agree, is that we don't take risk management as part of main strategy. It's one add-on, bolt-on somewhere, and then it comes. If it's bolt-on, it'll remain bolt-on. If it is not mainstream, it is not mainstream. 
I think it has to be part of the main strategy of the company. When you do your financial reviews every week, every month, or whenever you do it, risk management has to be reviewed with the same amount of rigor and has to be part of that whole process. It needs to have a board position, so you need to have a senior enough person who actually understands it and, and gives it. Secondly, every single individual out there needs to understand he's the risk management professional because every time he goes out, he or she goes out there, they are creating a risk for the company. And if they understand that, I think we would have uh, come over it, but it has to be driven at a top level. It has to get into, uh, we heard Anita George talk about affirmative action. I think affirmative action is very good. I've seen it work in so many places. Affirmative action actually works, and I think that's what co corporates need to do. It needs to be outcome-based. It needs to be put part of your performance goals, and you need to get evaluated, compensated, or whichever way, you know, if you're not done well, then you're not done well, and you will have to suffer for it. Thank you, Richard. And, you know, uh, since you made the comment, one of the things that came through during the consultation phase actually is exactly the problem that you called out, which is uh, for one of the reasonably, as I would say, extremely aspirational brands in the country, the feedback we got was, can the RMC really get into areas like m and and strategy? And I was like, if that's what is coming from an aspirational brand, those are possibly the two greatest risk areas we certainly have a problem to solve for. So as we wind this one up, the last one for you, which is, and you have touched upon this, but how do you see companies appreciating value creation, prevention of value erosion, value preservation, what do you want to call it? How does one amplify this? Because I don't think this room obviously gets it. But how do you amplify it for this to deserve, get where it deserves to? See, uh, whenever you start any new initiative, whether it is women on boards or corporate governance, everybody in the audience comes and asks me, show me empirical evidence. Don't talk all this rubbish because you're only, it's not going to help. And we have seen it. The companies which have more women on boards, three and more women on boards, have been financially more successful than the other companies. The question which I put to one audience was, suppose it was not Lehman Brothers, but Lehman Sisters, would it have survived? So, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, so the, the point is, uh, I think the way we should look at it is, uh, <coughs> we need to uh, uh, get uh, the people engaged into understanding what risk management is there. The CEOs and the board need to become more important of managing risk. Secondly, I think like corporate governance, overall corporate governance did, they improved the valuation. People want to see what will we get out of it at the end. Will we be better valued? Will we, there'll be no discounting when a private equity comes to invest in us or when somebody wants to buy us? If these kind of things can be proved through a good risk management process, I think that will that is the final outcome of it. But I think in the interim phase, it is how did the come even managing a loss is a is a gain. I mean, suppose a big risk event happened, and you didn't get impacted, your company didn't get impacted. Isn't that a benefit to others who got actually impacted? So how do we actually amplify this? And it is about amplification, about awareness. And I think, uh, Subhashish, we need to take it down to the uh, mediums. I, I think, Mr. Damodhan, you said about it, the backbone of our economy is the small and medium sector. I think we need to take it to the startup community. All the failures which we have seen in the startups after they grew was because of wrong m and And then you said you don't need risk management in m and I mean, it's a joke. So I think uh, one needs to look at every action of a company, new product launch, huge discounting in the market, everything needs to have a good. So uh, your risk management is a line one and line two for all technical people out here. Line two of defense or internal auditing is line three. So I think the line one and line two are both the senior management and middle level management who put the processes and policies in place. And those need to be actually, so when you make a decision in the market that I'm going to give a discount, you will then do it on a proper evaluation. Okay, by giving this discount, this is the maximum loss I will have, or this is the profit erosion I'll have. But on the other hand, I would have got gained market share, and I would have become a market leader or whatever. Because do we gain market share? I remember one of the top uh, companies in India where the chairman came to the company and said, so how much are you growing? So they said, oh, we are growing 20%. Uh, 
so he said, uh, how much market share have you gained? They had no answer. So the point is, it is market share gain and just not your growth, which is important because everybody is growing, you're also growing, so what's so great about it? So I think uh, risk management, when we can prove and, and show us, Subhashish, this is one work which you could carry out further with the team and everybody, is how do you do value creation, value preservation? If you spoke about those two words and we've heard it during the evening also. I think value creation, value preservation and the reward which sits at the end of risk if we can amplify all of this, I think we would have succeeded. Thank you so much, Richard. That was so you, direct, candid, no holding back. Thank you so much for your time.